All right. Um, thanks for everyone joining us here today in person, uh, as well as online virtually. Uh, DC traffic uh, strikes again, so apologies for the, for the slight delay. Um, but happy to kick things off. My name is David Lanham. I'm the VP of Content and Communications here at New America. Um, for those who aren't overly familiar with our organization, um, New America is a think and action tank dedicated to renewing the promise of America by continuing the quest to realize our nation's highest ideals, honestly confronting the challenges caused by rapid technological and social change, and seizing the opportunities those changes create. So typically, a think tank like us around DC will parade a panel of, of experts uh, on stage to discuss a lot of different policy topics, and we do plenty of that, it's important, but one of the things that makes New America unique is our aim to connect all of these important issues to people who are impacted by policy decisions, which leads us to The Alley, a podcast that New America launched in July 2023, just about a year and a half ago. Uh, I'll note uh, that the podcast was voted best local podcast by Washington City Paper earlier this year, and Apple, their editorial board, featured The Alley for an entire month on November. But awards aren't the focus here. If you'll indulge me, I'm gonna read you the podcast series description. On October 1st, 1984, Catherine Fuller was brutally murdered in the H Street Corridor in Northeast Washington, D.C. Her murder not only scarred the nation's capital forever, it also resulted in the most arrests in D.C. history for a single murder. Ultimately, eight young black men would be sentenced to life in prison as the direct result of detectives and federal prosecutors' negligent practices, ongoing systemic problems, and racism. For the first time, in their own words, these accused men recount their decades-long saga with the American criminal justice system that failed them. Listeners have heard from, from attorneys, law enforcement, journalists, and criminal reform advocates to help shine a light on the flaws and biases of our legal system still present today. This is the Alley, DC's eighth and H case. I'm gonna introduce in a moment Shannon Lynch, our studio manager and podcast production lead, who has absolutely brilliantly served as executive producer on this podcast series and has been so close in contact with the voices, the fantastic voices you're gonna hear and meet today. I most notably want to recognize the falsely accused men who have joined us here today, who you'll meet in a moment. Russell Overton, Timothy Catlett, Cliff Yarborough, Chris Turner, Charles Turner, Levi Rouse. Thank you each so much for sharing your story of courage, perseverance, and criminal justice. And if there's any journalists in the room, here in person or online, please continue to help write about their cases. And now I'll pass the podium mic to Shannon Lynch, our producer for today's event and conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to all of you for being here today. As David said, my name is Shannon Lynch, and I'm the podcast production lead and studio manager here at New America. I found out about the 8th and H case several years ago when I was living near the H Street corridor in Trinidad. I was shocked I'd never heard of it, and it bothered me that no one had covered it in its entirety in audio form. So I decided to do just that. I have to, of course, thank New America for supporting me in this project for the past three years. Now a little background. In 1984, Catherine Fuller was brutally raped and murdered in an alley near the, intersect near the intersection of 8th and H Streets Northeast. Her body was discovered by a street vendor who was set up on that corner that day. All day, the vendor noticed two young men walking up and down H Street as if they were casing it. After the vendor found the body, he noticed these same two men running away from the crime scene just as the police arrived. This should have been an open and shut case, but it wasn't. 
The two men who fled the scene of Mrs. Fuller's murder were never pursued, even though one of these men, James McMillan, would go on to murder another woman in an alley just a few blocks away from the Fuller crime scene. Instead of pursuing McMillan, within the first 24 hours of their investigation, MPD clung onto an anonymous tip that claimed the supposed 8th and H crew gang was responsible for the attack. Mind you, there was no 8th and H gang. It was just a group of kids who went to go-go's together. Nevertheless, cops pursued this theory and wouldn't look into any other possible scenarios for the rest of their investigation. Detectives started rounding up and interviewing hundreds of kids, more than 400, who hung out in the neighborhood and eventually came up with a story that doesn't really make any sense. They claimed Mrs. Fuller was attacked and dragged down the alley by a group of at least 17 teenagers with the sole motivation of robbing her. Keep in mind, several of these young people knew Mrs. Fuller as a member of their community. It wouldn't make much sense for a large group of them to rob her and split up the money. They would have known that she didn't have that much on her. Much like the Central Park Five case, AKA the Exonerated Five, police used aggressive and threatening tactics to get several false confessions out of a few of the teenagers they brought in. However, none of these confessions lined up with the physical evidence at the scene. The three witness statements that the detectives relied on most heavily were all later recanted. Nevertheless, the case went to trial based solely on these confessions. No physical evidence tied any of the defendants to the crime scene. No fingerprints, no shoe prints, no hair, nothing. Eight young men, six of whom are with us today, were handed life sentences. Russell Overton, Chris Turner, Timothy Catlett, Charles Turner, Cliff Yarbor Yarborough, and Levi Rouse collectively spent more than 200 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit. After completing their minimum sentences, they were all released on parole. However, even after getting out of prison, the murder charge that hangs over their heads continues to affect nearly every aspect of their lives. That is exactly what we will be discussing today. It's also the subject of the latest episode of Alley, which we're gonna play a quick clip of, about three minutes. I'm gonna come back and then we'll get to the main event of the panel discussion with all of the falsely accused men and one of their lawyers. On November 20th, 2024, my colleague Ben Sands and I walked to the White House which is just a block from the New America office. The sounds of drilling and pounding wood filled Lafayette Square. Construction had begun on the viewing stands for the presidential inauguration parade set to occur in exactly two months. We went to the White House to ask a simple question to Americans visiting the home of the president. What does a presidential pardon do? It uh, frees somebody from prison. During my conversations about the 8th and H case, the vast majority of people I talk to believe a presidential pardon is only good for one thing. Um, from what I'm understanding is it frees people that are wrongfully incarcerated. When I tell people that the falsely accused men applied for a presidential pardon, they almost always respond with the same question. Well, why do they need a pardon if they've already been released from prison? Even though Levi Rouse, Chris Turner, Charles Turner, Cliff Yarbrough, Timothy Catlett, and Russell Overton were released on parole after completing their minimum sentences, nearly every aspect of their lives are affected by the murder conviction that continues to hang over their heads. For starters, when they first got out, the prospect of just beginning their adult lives in their 50s and 60s was daunting. Here's Timothy Catlett. When I tell a lot of people, I say, Man, I'm like a 21, 22-year-old kid getting out here trying to find a way in life. You know, when I look at other people my age, you know, they got houses and cars and, you know, and here I am. I got out at 55 and I'm saying, man, where I'm going to start at? How I'm going to start? 
After facing the massive challenge of reorienting themselves in a society that bears little resemblance to the world they left in 1984, the men from the 8th and H case were subjected to many other obstacles. For example, their ability to form relationships and friendships after prison have been strongly affected by their continued status as convicted murderers. Charles Turner says he's hesitant to share the conviction with people he meets. You know, we go out in the world, we meet people, some people we become all right with, some people we don't. But for me, it's just always a part of me that I just, I know I'm not going to share with people. Due to their understandable mistrust of others, several of them live pretty isolated lives. Here's Russell Overton. I basically just be home with my family. I don't go out nowhere. You know, I just stay home and live off of one check at a time. Levi Rouse also avoids being around strangers. By me being incarcerated for so long, I don't trust people. I don't like being around people. We're, still, we're waiting on one, so hence the blank chair. Um, okay, well, I'm going to do a quick little intro of everyone. First, I'm going to start with Cliff Yarbrough, who is here to my left. Cliff devouts his work working days to providing physical and spiritual safe passage to school children. He takes care of his mother and spends all the free time he has volunteering in his community. Cliff was incarcerated at the age of 16 and spent more than 35 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Up here to my left is Timothy Catlett. Timothy Catlett is planning to get married to his fiance Monique next summer. He puts his head down and works 14 hours a day to earn an income for his new family. All the while, he volunteers at Free Minds Book Club and regularly attends church. Mr. Catlett was incarcerated at the age of 19 and spent more than 35 years in prison. Charles Turner is right here in the center, spends countless hours volunteering for Free Minds Book Club where he mentors young people reentering the community from prison. In his spare time, he volunteers at homeless shelters. He is a supervisor at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. Charles was 19 years old when he was incarcerated and spent more than 35 years in prison. Up here in the middle is Russell Overton. Russell has reconnected with his children after his release from prison. He has twice been awarded the Employee of the Month at work and was recently promoted to supervisor. Russell is passionate about pottery and he spends his free time crafting and painting his ceramic artworks. He was incarcerated at the age of 25 and spent more than 37 years in prison. Levi Rouse earned a degree, Levi is, who's not here yet, I'm still gonna introduce him. <laughs> Levi Rouse earned a degree in computer science and recently got married to a wonderful pastor. Levi walks everywhere he goes in DC. He actually told me one time that the most he's walked in a day is 20 miles. He walks everywhere. And it's because he just likes having, you know, this freedom after not being able to walk that distance for so long. Uh, Mr. Rouse was incarcerated at the age of 19 and spent more than 35 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Next, all the way in the top row at the other end, is Chris Turner. And yes, Chris and Charles are brothers. Uh, Chris is a dedicated employee of the Duke Ellington School of the Arts. Chris helps run and advise multiple nonprofit organizations dedicated to the wrongfully accused and other individuals re-entering society after incarceration. Earlier this year, the Greater Washington Urban League awarded Chris its 2024 Community Impact Award. He was incarcerated at the age of 19 and spent 26 years in prison. And lastly, we have Ben Waldman. Ben is an associate at Williams and Conley and a member of the legal team, which helped these men write their pardon applications. So just to start, first of all, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, yeah, of course. Um, I'd like to start with you, Charles. What was your life like in 1984 before all of this started? Oh, regular. I mean, I was a regular teenager. At the time, I, was, I went back to school, continuing my adult education. I dropped out 
in 11th grade. So in 1984, I was going back to school. And I, and I was working. I was going to school till 12. And then after I got off, I was working at Gallaudet University. So I had a pretty normal life at that time in, in 1984. Cliff, what was your childhood like? Well, um, I was basically, I liked to play basketball a lot. So I was, I was playing a lot of school ball and also I played a lot of rec center ball. But, um, you know, I was you know, in the 10th grade prior to me going to prison. And um, I had made a varsity my first year in high school. So but I had a pretty normal life. I was just like the sports and I did like to go to the Go to go goes as we did. You know, we went back as a young kid. So, but I had a pretty normal childhood. So, anyone else want to answer that question? What your life was like in 1982? Oh, that's it. You know, like like you said, life as a kid. You know, I believe in living your life as a kid, and that's the way I was before I got incarcerated. And uh, I had a good, I I childhood up until that time, you know, but uh, it was the average life of a kid, just doing different things, as he say, going to go-go's, uh, going where everywhere for real, you know, just moving around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, with me, I was like, you know, I was enjoying life. I ended up having a son and during the process of that, I was working with this, uh, like a Pepco company down on Benton Road. And my son was born, and I was just trying to take care of him. You know, that's my third child, so. And I don't have no boys, I had two girls. So I was really into him, you know. And just living the life, you know. Well, I. All the guys spoke and see, we all grew up together and we hung out with the perception of Russell who was much older than us. But we played sports together. We did the go-go together. We had a normal life. Uh, we worked, went to school. I graduated when I was 17 from Coolidge High School. And I, I always wanted to go into the Air Force. That was my dream. Uh, we grew up uh, playing around the Pentagon, my brother and all of us and my cousins and we swam in all those fountains that you see now that are now closed but we used to swim at union station and unbelievable we go back now and looking like man what was we that crazy we were diving off of this thing and we were we were diving in we used to swim in the reflection all those pools you see don't try it now but we did it then and um we were having fun you know we that's that was our playing field we literally grew up on Capitol Hill. We <clears throat> played hide and go see in the bushes at the Supreme Court. You know, who would think years later they would have to decide on our fate? And, you know, um, but those are the things we did in our adolescent years and, you know, had fun. And, you know, we were just uh, regular neighborhood kids that um, loved the community, did a lot of arcade. Uh, my brother still think he could, he was a better person than this Pac-Man than me, but <laughs> there's a bunch of arguments. Uh, Hollywood, who's not with us today, Kelvin Smith, he would argue that he was the best, but um, at the end of the day, you know, I actually was the best. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. Um, I have a quick follow-up question on that. Maybe just one of you can answer. But what was that intersection like? Could you kind of paint a picture? Because it's so different now, the, the intersection of 8th and 8th Streets, Northeast. Um, what was it like at that time? Well, so far as the neighborhood, it was just a bunch of kids growing up. No, that intersection. Like, OK, yeah. But I'm saying all of y'all hung in the park off and on, because I was there some time. But they growed up being in the neighborhood being friends with other people and trying to grow up as a kid, always, you know, try to do what's right. But when this happened, it kind of turned everybody's eyes, you know, and everybody felt 
you know, they, they were sour. They was, they, their mind was transformed into, by the media, making us look like animals. Not knowing that you're locking up innocent people. You know, I mean, I know all of them. I used to hang with Charles and Christopher's sister. My best friend was Steve, her, his, her boyfriend. And it wasn't nothing like that going on around the neighborhood. This is something that never happened around our neighborhood. I was born and raised there. I never seen nothing like this happen. So it was like a normal neighborhood until this thing happened. And everybody just hung out and tried to have a nice time. At, at night, I didn't see none of these guys out at night because I was hanging out at night with my girlfriend till I had my son, you know. And it's, it's terrible, man. I mean, the neighborhood just told that if you go down there now, I don't even go down there because it looked bad. It looked terrible down there. The neighborhood when we were growing up, though, was like there was vendors all up and down yeah. A Street. There was tons of people selling their merchandise. You could go down A Street at any given moment. It, there's vendors on every four corners. That quad, that whole thing, the park is behind it. There's a ton of people in the park. Some people are shooting dice. Some people are back there playing cards. A bunch of people win. are waiting on the buses. Some people back there drinking. <laughs> there are, it's a completely business district up and down mm. there. People are shopping. People are going to Snyder's shoe store. People are going to Murray Steakhouse. You have People's Drug Store. So there are businesses up and down there. There are some guys across the street, different type of vendors. We had a guy who had his fruit stand on the side of 8th and H where the park was. Across was the bank. And you had two people with stands out there, one next to the bank and one in front of the bank, it was selling an jewelry and, and everything. Where you can go from one end of the uh, southeast to northwest to yeah. Silver Spring. It's, it was the direction area where everybody can go whatever way they want to go. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, it was like a it, main yeah, transfer uh, hub. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just mm -hmm. like a fence, right. Yeah. So it's crowded. It's, it's the people, especially the first of the month, you can barely walk down the street, it's so crowded. Exactly. You yeah. know, and you got, you got people that comes out there just to hang out and, you know, have fun. You know, I mean, I hung out, out there and have fun, you know, but so far it's just, Doing what's wrong, it wasn't none of that going on out there. Them? I think the intersection for us, you know, not so much for Russell, but for us, that's where the good place where we can meet at. Mm -hmm. The intersection for us to go somewhere, whether we going over to another area or whatever, that was just an easy place for us to meet at, mm -hmm. you know, when we going somewhere. Yeah. You know. And what they're saying is really important because uh, like Levi, or sorry, Mr. Overton just mentioned, um, this murder happened on the first of the month, October 1st, 1984. And so it was a very busy time. It was already an extremely busy business district, probably even more so, I would say, here, here comes Levi. <laughs> um, and there were no independent witnesses in this case. And so, to have this theory that a group of 20-something teenagers committed this crime on the busiest day of the month in the busiest intersection of the whole neighborhood, it doesn't really make sense because like, if no one else saw it, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. You see where like the logic doesn't completely jive. Um, okay, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. I'm gonna ask a question to Ben. Um, first of all, Ben, how long have you been working with these men? And also, can you give a little brief interview or overview on their path to justice? Sure. Um, so I've only had the opportunity to work with you all for, I think, a, un, just under a year. But my firm, uh, Williams & Connolly, has now worked with uh, Cliff for 15 years. Um, and we work with the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project on this case. And they have worked on this case for over, we think, about 20 years. 20 years basically since the founding of the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project, this case has been um, a focal point. And I think in my firm, about a dozen lawyers have worked on this at this point. And I think both our 
commitment to this and the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project's commitment uh, show just how certain we are that these guys are innocent and that these are uh, tremendous people worthy of, of a pardon and a fair treatment by our justice system. Mm -hmm. um, and what was the second part of the question? Um, just kind of an overview of their path to justice, so like yeah. the post-conviction proceedings. And yeah. So uh, you may have covered this in the intro. The, these guys were convicted in 1985, and this case, despite their continued efforts and advocacy from behind bars, sat dormant for over a decade until a reporter, an intrepid reporter from the Washington Post, uh, Patrice Gaines, who had sat through the initial trial, but it never quite sat right with her, uh, submitted FOIA requests and dug through the case and figured out that not, was, not all was as it, as it seemed and that there was more to this case. Um, after she filed FOIA requests, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project got involved, and in 2010, I think it was, uh, they had a uh, evidentiary hearing where they sought a new trial. 2012. Uh, it was 2012, right. Uh, 2012, they sought a new trial um, on the basis of um, all the evidence that had emerged since <laughs> their convictions. Uh, James McMillan's subsequent identical murder, uh, the um, re recantations of all of the, re uh, recantations of nearly all of the trial witnesses, um, and the fact that the prosecutors had never turned over McMillan's identity during the 1985 trial. Uh, so that was essentially a new trial. Um, they all did a really wonderful job and testified, and I'm sure it wasn't easy to relive the 1985 trial. Um, and unfortunately, the court, the Superior Court, decided against these guys in 2012. Uh, we appealed it. It went up to D.C.'s Court of Appeals, which is essentially the state Supreme Court for D.C. Um, and we lost there, and then we appealed again. And uh, the Supreme Court in the United States grants something like 1% of the petitions it receives to hear cases. Um, and in these guys' case, the Supreme Court granted the uh, request to hear the case. So in 2017, this case, uh, we, we argued this case, a partner from my firm, John Williams, argued this case at the Supreme Court. Um, and essentially, because, and we'll get into this, I'm sure, with why are these guys seeking a pardon, because of a loophole in something called the Brady Rule, the Supreme Court couldn't examine all of the evidence that has emerged through the decades about these guys' innocence. So because of that legal loophole and the fact that uh, James McMillan's copycat murder didn't occur in, until after their initial trial, um, the Supreme Court denied their appeal. Um, and that's how we've ended up with the pardons. Thanks. That was a great overview. I'd like to pivot a little bit, and I'd like to ask each of you to share something that you're proud of or something that you've achieved since leaving prison? It can be something small, it can be something big. Uh, me, uh, my wife standing in the back, she got married. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so giving a hand to her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just being home, y'all, I finished college. Uh, I got a good job. So. With, with me, my mother, she's 86 years old. She's the only elderly person left in my, in my family. Pat, which is his wife, is my first cousin. And I got a good job. I go to work. I love my job, you know. I love coming home, taking care of my family, you know. My kids, I try to give them, but, but most important is my mother. She's 86, she got dementia, and taking care of her makes me feel proud, you know, that I'm able to do something for her. I'm home with my parents. Being a child.
I'm, I'm, I'm proud just to be alive, you know, uh, after what we've been through, just to make it out the door because <clears throat> I never thought it possible, even though I had hoped or was hoping that one day mm -hmm. it could be flipped over, but it never happened. And I just, you know, I never thought about parole. Parole what? But when it came up, then I'm saying, okay, I got a shot, but I can't plead, I can't say I did something that I didn't do. Mm -hmm. So of course you don't buckle down, they gonna just keep setting you back. But eventually I got out and I'm proud to be out here. I have a fiance, I have a job. I'm just, I'm proud to be working. Because I, <laughs> I look at a lot of people, the way they laying a lot of people off now, I didn't like my job but it was a job to make money and to pay rent and everything. But now, hey, I enjoy it, you know, <laughs> I enjoy it. The thing I'm most proud of, mostly like the brother before me, I never thought I would be here, that you would even meet me, that I would get to see anybody, you would get to see me. So when the time, but when the time came when I thought I may be able to make it out. You know, a lot of things start running through my head, like how I would live, how I would survive, you know. Uh, turns out, you know, I've done pretty good at it. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm really proud of being able to find a job, keep a job, be able to pay bills. Like I've upgraded my car, things like this is, is big to me, being able to have my own house, working on getting my own house now. So it's just the regular things that means a lot to me and, and that I'm proud of being able to perform the duties of a regular person out here. Um, my, myself, uh, to piggyback off um, Tim and um, Charles is that I've done most of my time with Charles, but, and I used to walk, and I used to always say to him, and, I thought, I thought I'd never have this opportunity as well as being out here um, um, to see you all and um, to live the life I'm living. And I'm also proud of um, my way of, of getting the opportunity to do the things I said I wanted to do, like work with the youth, to give back to them because I went in as a youth myself. And to be able to give back to them and spend time around them, um, be able to have my own car, um, you know, to, to do my responsibilities on, on this side, living the, the righteous life, the best life, the right way, is good. I mean, I also, I have a special woman in my life right now, and she, she always there to help me in any way possibly I can when I go through my problem with the laptop that I'm learning more of. She always there to help me. But to be here and, like he said, uh, be living for what we have went through, I'm proud of myself. Um, what I'm proud of, I'm, I'm actually proud of all these men and how they're living their life and what that they took, uh, what life dealt to them and they made the most out of it without complaining. And I'm proud that I get to be an example for other uh, people who are still incarcerated, people who coming home, they get a chance to see me, they think oh, I got this magic wand where I can get everybody out of jail because they think that uh, I was the turning force that got the guys out of jail when um, we all persevered and everyone had to go through their own tr uh, trials and tribulation, but um, reinventing myself making myself um, into uh, a person that society would be proud of and, you know, people would want to be around. Um, I'm also proud that I got a chance to do, I always said I got a chance to do everything I wanted to do in life except go to the Air Force and get married. So now finally I get a chance, I found me a fiance, somebody that could put up with me uh, in the back. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> 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 
So I'm just really proud of those things as well as receiving, like you say, the impact award. It, uh, when I accepted that award from the Greater Washington Urban League, um, I told them I was accepting it on behalf of all the individuals, because all these men up here, they volunteer their time when we do the back to school backpack giveaways to children. You, I don't even have enough, you know, I got to say no to some, some of the guys. You know, the guys all up here helping other people who are coming home because it gives their life purpose and meaning. And that's the thing that you should look at when you're issuing a part and things like that, what the character of the men is, what their core is. These men easily could be bitter, they could be angry, they could be upset, they could be mad at everyone walking past them, but instead, you know, they put their energy into still helping the community that didn't always stand by them. Because mm -hmm. now it's popular to stand by the guys once all the facts have came out, but once upon a time, we were looked at as the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people used to always tell that, why is the dudes going to the law library? Why is they trying to go for parole? They ain't never letting them out. They never can't let them out. They got the worst case in the history of D.C. And But here we are today standing there. And so I'm proud of that. Proud of also um, the Greater uh, Washington Urban League, Free Minds, Healing Justice, Mid-Atlantic, all of them give me an opportunity to sit on the board and, you know, give my vision and my version of facts and make me look like I'm more than what I am. And so I'm proud that they give me that opportunity. Um, that's great. Um, you are a lot, Chris. You're, 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 don't, don't try and say that you're not a great individual because you are. <laughs> Why are y'all laughing? <laughs> Something that I, over the past few years, getting to know these guys, they like kind of jab and make fun of each other a lot, and it's really funny um, to see. <laughs> um, okay, so I have two more questions, and then we're gonna go to audience questions slash if there are any online questions. I don't know where Carly is, but, oh, Emily, just kidding. Um, okay, so second to last question, and this is, for everyone, I don't know if Ben, you might want to start the answer of this question, but what goes into um, the process of writing presidential pardon applications? Yeah, I, quickly I'd also say, explain why we're looking for presidential pardon. So uh, this crime, if it occurred in any other state or any state in the country, this would be a state crime where the governor could issue a pardon, but we, are going to the president because this occurred in D.C. D.C. doesn't have a governor. The mayor doesn't have the clemency power. So that's why we're going to President Biden and why it's so important, um, that, why our path goes through, through the president. Uh, there's no uh, one right answer as to what goes into a clemency application or a pardon application. Um, for these guys, because we know that they're innocent, and we wanted to explain their innocence, and we also wanted to highlight the people they are. We focused on that, and, and they did in their applications and their essays. Um, so we talked about, they talked about their innocence, the fact that we know that someone else did this horrible crime, um, and then did something very similar the second he got out of prison, or weeks after he got out of prison, uh, uh, about eight years later. We talked about the fact that there's no uh, physical evidence, um, and at this point, no witness testimony supporting their convictions. And we talked about the people that they are today. Um, pardons are, can be issued on the basis of innocence. The Supreme Court has talked about this. President Biden has issued pardons on the basis of innocence. Um, but obviously, pardons mean something more than just someone uh, they are often granted for more than just innocence, and these guys are so deserving of pardons because of their incredible community work, the people they are today, and the fact that they're innocent. And we think that combination of their, um, the, the people they are today compared to what James McMillan did when he left prison further underscores their, their innocence and why they deserve pardons. Mm -hmm. um, so they each wrote essays um, about how the pardon would impact them, what their lives have been like because of the pardon. They talked about their community work. Um, 
they had to fill out a lot of forms. <laughs> uh, and uh, the applications also included so many countless letters from community members, from um, other, from folks they work with, talking about what incredible humans these guys are and the impact they've made on their community. Um, we also included public reporting, including the podcast. Um, and uh, Tom Dibdahl's book and some other public reporting and the Netflix show. Um, and we are continuing to supplement those applications. There's a website uh, that I'm sure you've mentioned, ethanhjustice.org, where you can write messages and we are sending them in as we get them to the uh, Justice Department. So it's a continuing process, but I think we filed about four or 500 pages for each of them, including really heartfelt letters that each of the, and, and essays that each of the guys wrote. Yeah, so I'd like to ask about those essays in particular um, for any of you that want to answer. Uh, what went into that essay that you wrote for your pardon application, and how did you express what a pardon would mean to you? Well, for me, it, it was the truth. I don't care how many years go by, your story won't change. You know, and writing that essay is like, you know, you, you just, what's in your heart is what you put on that paper. You know, and that pardon would mean, that would mean so much because it would open up so many doors that was closed to us then it's closed now. You know, uh, I don't make the, the best money in the world you know, because when I do try to get jobs that's worthwhile, it's always the background. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get the pardon, it's going to always be the background unless you just know somebody that knows somebody where you be able to get a job that's worthwhile. You know, so a pardon would mean that's, <coughs> I don't even think a miracle would be the word for it. You know, so we just keep the fingers crossed and keep it moving. Yeah. Um, to pick it back off, um, Tim, a pardon would mean a lot for me as well as I know the other guys are sitting up here with me as far as clearing our name for a brutal murder that took place. You know, um, our name is slandered so bad, as Chris spoke about earlier. But so a pardon for me would not only clear my name, as I said before, it'll clear my family name as well. Uh, it took the words right out of my mouth. You know, a pardon is very important to me because it's slander. My name, my family name, it just outright made us look like animals. And from learning these guys, being around them, talking to them, these guys don't bother nobody. And it, it would be better if they would just stand up and look at what they done. They hurt people, they hurt people's family. You know, I, I feel my grandmother got ill and passed away because I got locked up for this hideous crime. It's, it's sad, but I try to move forward. I try not to let it bother me, but sometimes it do bother me because it's, it's, it makes you feel uncomfortable. You know, and I, when I be around people, I like the people to look at me as a human being, a decent person, instead of look and sniggle behind my back like, you know, I, I work hard. I go to church every Sunday. You know, when I leave church, I come home, I pray with my mother, my sister, we get around the bed and pray as a family. And I want my family to be happy. They're not happy because we still have this mean, a, a slander been put against us. And the only way you can do this is, is give us a pardon and let us be happy and be free as a family. As somebody that's want to walk down the street without feeling sad or hold his head down, I refuse to do that because I'm innocent. And I wish the president give me a pardon because he see the sincerity in me. I work hard, I come home from, home, from work, and I be with my family. That means a lot to me, my family. And I wish he do clear my name. Pardon for me. Apart from um, giving me a little bit of relief, because it's always it's gonna always be my 
the only thing that would satisfy me in its in totality is if the whole public knew exactly what was done. The same way they used the media to uh, misrepresent us, the media, I feel like it should be used to help exonerate us in the eyes of the public. It's big for me that the public understand what was done to us. And that's not even mentioning, you know, to be given a pardon, like it, it helps you with a lot of things. See, what we don't speak about is the personal relationships. People don't understand it. You know, uh, if I go to meet a woman, right, certain parts of me that I feel like I got to withhold. Like, if you tell somebody that, you know, I was locked up for Captain Fuller murder in 1984, you don't know how people are going to relate to that, how they're going to take that. So, a lot of that is, you know, been on my mind and in my heart. So it would be very important for the part. The pardon is good for me, but unless the whole world knows, man, this was done to them guys, this was done to them, it was wrong, they did it wrong, they did a terrible thing. I want everybody to know it. And I, that's the only way I would feel totally at peace. Mm -hmm. And especially given all that I lost, my mother, my father, my grandmother, all the things, I wasn't able to bear children. All these things are very important to me, as they should be to everybody, all of the guys. And so this is why it would be important to pardon is good, and I, and I would thank the president if he saw fit to do so. You know, it would be a great boon, and I would, you know, I would be very appreciative. But for me, it has to go further than that. The public has to know, because they lied to the public, too. You know, they got people to lie on us to get us convicted. They also lied to the people in the public, the people that was on the jury. You know, they pulled the wool over their eyes. There's a lot of things that was done that was so wrong that need to be set right. And it, the same way they did it in the media, they should do it. When, when we get a pardon, it should be thrown out there. But it's still, that's not enough. Not for me. You know. Thank you. It was my turn. Uh, <laughs> uh, a pardon, it, w it would be wonderful for me to get a pardon. But uh, the way I live my life, I trust God. So if I don't get a pardon, I'm already pardoned because he pardoned me. So I don't worry about that, you know, but if they give me one, wonderful. If not, I'm going to live my life because I've already been pardoned by God because he's the only one know the truth. <laughs> Way to go, Pastor. <laughs> uh, a pardon for me is pretty much what everybody up here on the stage said what it would mean, and but also what it would mean to our supporters, New America, uh, all the people, the Mid Atlantic, Williams and Connolly, the firms that stood behind us, you know, and they did this when it wasn't popular to do it, you know. Now, you know, many things are coming out, you know. New America actually took this case apart and put it back together for anyone who hadn't had a chance to watch the series on the alley. They actually go in front of the curve, so to speak, of laying the foundation of H Street and what it was and the political side of our conviction, because that's not mentioned. It was also politically involved. Every time I go down H Street and everybody say, man, why are you always that? Because that's mine. I feel like I, I built H Street. They use this, you know, the, I'm getting on the street car, I'm getting on it, even if it's only going four blocks, I'm going to get on it. Because I felt like this, I'm entitled to this. That's right. You know, and so that's what a, a pardon, though, would also, like you clear our names and validate the people who supported us when it wasn't popular to do so. And so that's, that's how I would feel for the pardon and why I think we deserve a pardon. Very, very well said. Um, I think we're going to have some time for a few questions. Um, looks like we already have some folks in person here that want to ask. Uh, we can probably take, I don't know, a few from in the room and then, Emily, do we have any online yet? Nope, that's okay. We will take all from in the room. Um, so I saw you first. 
uh, my name is Cammy, but I work as a journalist, and my, I live in black neighborhood uh, on the uh, 17 and H Northeast, very close. Okay. So I understand you. So my question to you is this, you guys, that do you feel lack of empathy or sympathy uh, uh, in black community about the people like yourself who are in unfortunate situation? And my question to, to white folks is that, do you think that jury system is really very biased against people of color? I was in a grand jury, and uh, the guy on my left, he was African-American, and I asked him, why do you, man, these people are robots, they don't have common sense, you are just trying to convict everybody here. And they said, oh, these US assistant attorney general, they have, they, I said, this is nonsense, they just want to make their resume good, CV good, there is really, so people, then they, uh, it grand jury was like for a month and a half, and at the end of the month, they fired me. <laughs> there mm -hmm. was a black lady who was in charge, a white lady. I said, listen, you know, you, you don't come from these kind of circumstances. Probably you got your law degree by getting student loan or your parents are rich. You don't know the circumstances, and these people are just convicting them, filling the jail. And God bless Trump, he knows that it's a waste of taxpayers' money, and I hope that he get all you guys out, you know, who are in prison. Uh, so again, my question is, is grand jury basically, uh, uh, I don't know much because you know I'm a foreigner here. <laughs> so it's designed against black people and uh, why there is a lack of, you know, the guy who was on my left in jury, uh, even he didn't show much sympathy uh, for guys and they fired me because uh, I would just vote against everybody else because I thought these people are not really criminal. At least they were not born criminal. Maybe your circumstances, they made these mistakes because they are in very uh, tough circumstances. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes. Um, look, this case goes back a long way and it's complicated. Um, it, the, the backstory of the neighborhood is complicated, but what I think is clear is that uh, an injustice took place um, and that can only be remedied from a presidential pardon. Mm -hmm. And we're seeking it right now from President Biden and if President Biden doesn't issue one, we'll continue to seek it from President Trump. Um, there are certainly issues of systemic racism that were uh, present in the police system and, and the uh, criminal justice system and that probably contributed to this case. Um, but we think is, what we think is even more important here is just that the facts show these guys were innocent and, um, and that's our focus is, is shining a light on who these guys are their innocence and uh, and the people that they are and, and that they're deserving of a pardon. Mm. Does anyone want to add anything to that? Should we move to the next question? Next question. Okay. Next question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Just wait for the mic to come. Hi, my name's Toby Dore, and I had some of these guys on my podcast, and and I just love them all, and I think their story is just tragic, but unfortunately. Their story is not that surprising because there's a lot of those stories out there. And I think a lot of people who don't really, haven't really been involved with the justice system think that once you're out of prison, you got it made. But that's not the case. I mean, you can't go to Canada. You can't go to London. You can't vote in the state of Virginia unless the governor clears you to vote on a case-by-case -case basis. There's so many things that you can't do when you have a felony on your record. So your sentence is never served, ever. You have it hanging over your head till the day you die. And when you didn't do anything to deserve it, it is just so unjust. And, you know, this gentleman was so correct. I think prosecutors live for win tallies, you know, guilty tallies, and they don't care. They truly don't care if it's the truth or not. And, you know, it's just so frustrating. And you know, my husband and I are on a mission to end the felony murder conviction because that is such an unjust thing too. But you guys were done so wrong and I'm so glad that somebody's looking and, and you're getting some attention and, and I pray every day that you get your pardon. Is there a status on the pardon? Do you, will you know? Will it just like be a call that's done? They won't like say, oh, we're getting there. You just don't know till it's done. Yeah, the pardon process is not like a typical uh, court proceeding. It's a bit of a black box. Yeah. So. Uh, we're trying everything we can to make the case for these guys, but we won't know um, till we know. Yeah, well, I'm excited, so I can't wait to see it happen. Thank you. I'll also just add really quickly, um, 
historically, most presidential pardons happen right before a president leaves office. So as we know from history, most of Biden's pardons will likely happen within the last week or few days that he's in the White House. So um, potentially next month, mid next month. So. Uh, it's following up on something that many of you alluded to, but especially Mr. Charles Turner said, you know, you went in 1985, the media landscape was very different. There wasn't a Fox News, there wasn't a right wing media ecosystem, there wasn't, you know, Sinclair didn't own WJLA. Mm. Are there times when you look at the media, media ecosystem now and think if this case, e extraordinary as it might be, this case happened today, what the media ecosystem would have been like? for you or might be like for other young men wrongfully accused uh, in this day and age? Well, personally, I, I think um, having spoken with a lot of the younger people, the more progressive minded people, and I've spoken to quite a few over in MLK library, you meet everybody, everybody from all every country in the world, I'm telling you. And I've met a lot of progressive minded people and I believed had our you say if our crime would have would have happened, it's not our crime, but if that would have happened today, I don't believe it could have happened to us because of what you spoke about, because of the media, the the different media outlets, the podcasts you have, you know, the TikToks and the even Facebook, all these media outlets, I really don't think it would be the same as it was. There's nowhere near it. I just think you know, um, society is people are a lot smarter now. They can see through a lot of stuff. A lot of things that was presented then, you just couldn't present it to a jury today and not have them be like, wait a minute, this just doesn't look right. And then when you think about it, if you think about our jury had deliberated so long, right, it, you know, something was wrong. And today, I just don't believe, I just believe that society is just smarter. People just a little more, they're more like enlightened now. And they just can see through a lot of, a lot of garbage. So that was a good question. So I really don't have a question. I actually want to uh, commend y'all. Thank you. One, y'all uh, did 35, I think the least time was what, 28, 27 or something like that? Mm -hmm. And to set in prison, I did 13 years myself, but to set in prison and then for y'all not to be angry. Mm -hmm. Y'all could be upset, mm -hmm. pissed off, and have a right. Mm -hmm. But to come out and not just to show who you are, who you truly are. Y'all didn't even go in for something you done. I did wrong. Mm -hmm. Y'all came out and became the best versions of yourself. I can just imagine the things that you learned in there. But y'all are giving back. And for me, I just sat up here and look, I was crying mm -hmm. all because of the fact that I see y'all, but the world needs to see you. Mm -hmm. The world not, not only just supposed to give you a pardon, but to see who you have become. Each and every one of y'all either help youth or you're just helping people, period. And for me, that means a lot because I meet a lot of men that I met sitting in the federal prison that come home and do the same thing they judge us not for who we used to be, not for who we are today. And y'all wasn't even, once again, y'all didn't even commit the crime. Mm -hmm. But y'all became better, better people than even who y'all were then. And I commend you for going to school, getting a degree, mm -hmm. speaking to kids, said, look, going to the library. Mm -hmm. I thank y'all for being who you are. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Okay. Hello, everybody. I just want to say congratulations. I'm very proud of all of you. Thank you. God will prevail. You will get everything that you need because a way will be made for you because you're leading a new light. America needs a new light behind darkness and everything that God has for you, he has for you. And don't have no other thought or no inkling feeling that what is for you on this earth is for you. 
just want to say congratulations for all of y'all's successes, everything that you are, everything that you will become, and the light that you will shine in the future on men, that they will see your good works and know that the time has come and a new day has begun for each and every one of you. May God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Emily's going to be mad at me, but I'm going to take one more, one more question. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, right here in the... Uh, I saw him. You guys can rock, paper, scissors for it. Okay, go for it. Uh, I'd like to say that listening to you guys' story, you know, very touched. I'm not familiar with your case, right? But I am familiar with black and brown people being wrongfully accused uh, so many times, right? We see this story so many times. And I like to applaud you guys, piggyback off what my guy said, applaud you guys for coming out and being productive because you could have took a whole different attitude. You could have just came home, stayed to yourselves, but you decided to pull back into your community as well, right? And we know that uh, this system needs a, a overhaul, right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that I, I hope I hope that it crumbles so we can rebuild it again because mm -hmm. the only time you can ever rebuild anything is if you destroy it first, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I want you guys to keep doing what you're doing because we do know that we in a system that is not always favorable to us. And I pray that you do get the pardon, but if you don't, keep with your mission because God already pulled you out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it's time to continue to keep taking care of ourselves, keep building for ourselves, mm -hmm. keep representing for ourselves, and to keep pouring back in because even though you, you, know, you went through what you went through, you know you still was chosen for what you went through. And it's up to each and every one of you, even myself, to pull back into your community and take care of the community and to be able to give the young ones that's coming up now the example because a lot of them are going through the same things. You know, they always say ain't nothing new under the sun right now. Mm -hmm. So make sure that we pouring back and giving back to the youth and letting them know that, you know, the things that you went through, uh, giving them different routes. You know, we all we got, you know what I mean? I, I applaud anybody else that's, you know, outside of the black community that participates and, and tries to help and everything, but it's up to us. You know what I mean? It's up to us to do for one another. And uh, if we continue to do that, we're going to be all right. You know what I mean? To get respect, you got to give respect, and we got to give respect to our own communities. So I applaud you guys. And I love y'all. I don't even know, but I love y'all. All right. Um, unfortunately, I think we're all out of time for now. We are going to have a reception, though, right after. So uh, if anyone wants to continue the conversation, please do. We have some food and drinks out here in the atrium. But before we go, I just want to say especially thank you to all of you for allowing me and trusting me to work on this project with you. I Really, truly, from the bottom of my heart, I'm so honored, and I appreciate you so much. Um, you. Of course, and thank you to all of you for coming. Um, coming it, it thank you. Means everybody. a lot. Thank and you. Thank you.